Good evening and welcome. I'm Stephanie Browner, I'm the Dean of Eugene Lane College, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the last event of a week-long residency with Bell Hooks. For many in our community, this has been a remarkable week. I've seen many of you at many events. We've had radical conversations about radical pedagogy, about I confess, I transgress. We have celebrated 20 years since the publication of Teaching to Transgress. We've explored radical thinking, radical thought, decolonizing the imagination. But I think most of all, we've had radical honesty, radical openness, and from Bell Hooks, radical generosity. That doesn't mean it's sentimental, never. It doesn't mean it's casual and sloppy. Radical generosity is an act of taking every person seriously, ideas seriously, and entering honestly and rigorously into nuanced conversations. Tonight, Bell is joined by Arthur Jaffa. He is an artist, filmmaker, and cinematographer. He is the director of Slowly This in 1995, Tree in 1999, and Des Houghton 1.0 in 2009. His cinemagraphic work includes Daughters of the Dust, 1991, for which he won the Cinematography Award at Sundance Film Festival. He also worked on Seven Songs for Malcolm X in 1993 and Crooklyn in 1994, directed by Spike Lee. He writes on black cultural politics, and his writing has appeared in many publications, including Black Popular Culture and Everything But the Burden. His most recent work is Dreams Are Colder Than Death. It's a short documentary and includes conversations and words and thoughts from Kara Walker, Hortense Spillers, Fred Moten, Kathleen Cleaver, Charles Burnett, Wagenshi Mutu, Saidiya Hartman, and Melvin Gibbs, and others. And it asks, what does it mean to be black in America in the 21st century? And Bell Hooks, one last introduction. For more than three decades, Bell has been recognized internationally as a scholar, poet, author, and radical thinker. Dozens of books and many, many articles that she has published span all these genres, including cultural and political analyses and critiques, personal memoirs, poetry collections, and children's books. Her writings cover topics of gender, race, class, spirituality, teaching and the significance of media in contemporary culture. It is my pleasure to thank Bell for a week of conversation with our community and to welcome all of you to the final conversation and for the celebration after the conversation, food and champagne, to honor this week of work and conversation and the generosity and radical thinking of Bell Hooks and all the colleagues she has brought into conversation. Thank you. I can't think of anyone more relevant to end this week of conversation with than my friend, comrade, and fellow creator of decolonized thoughts, images, representations than AJ. From the moment I met him and saw the images that he produced in, in the words of Jackie Wilson, I was lifted higher. And I always use him as my example of what the decolonized gaze can produce. Now, last night, those of you who were at our wacky sexual transgression um, panel know that the question I kept asking is, who's looking? Who is looking and what do they see? And in many ways, Every work that AJ does poses that question in a radical, critical way. Um, through, sort of, you know the phrase, back at you. Well, his images come back at us, um, forcing us to think about, what is it I'm seeing? Why, is I'm, why am I seeing it this way? This isn't the conventional way of looking. So hopefully we can begin by him talking a little bit about where his vision comes from after we 
see a couple of clips? Are they ready? Are they ready? Yeah? Or should I just? Okay. So, <laughs> talk. <laughs> um, hmm. Yeah, I know, you know, at a certain point, I guess, uh, the sorts of things that uh, Bell was raising, I guess, <clears throat> I guess the word is obsess. You know, <laughs> you obsess about these things so long that uh, at a certain certain point, it's, it almost ceases to be, uh, not holy, but ceases on a certain level to be an intellectual proposition almost. It's almost like you end up feeling it on your nervous system, speaking to my mic. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to show up two things. Um, and in a way, I think, I think they're interesting just because they bookend two uh, poles, in a sense, of um, my practice, so to speak. One is not properly speaking of film at all. It's uh, show them until 6.30. Is this fine with me? Yeah, OK. <laughs> and why is that? <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, OK. We can't see the images until 6.30. What time is it now? <laughs> Cinderella. <laughs> 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 Turn to a pumpkin or something. Um, but um, in any event, I'm, I'm still going to, it's all right for me to still talk about them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, but anyway, they sort of like uh, bookmark like two poles, I guess. Uh, one is a thing called Apex, and it's, uh, uh, it's not even properly speaking of film, even. I was just in Scotland uh, a week and a half ago, um, and uh, I did a, a, a conversation with the sister, Kara Killing. I don't know if you know her. She's at USC. She's a film theorist. She's really smart, interesting. She has a book called um, The Witch's Flight, which is a, a consideration of how the black figure, the queer figure, the film figure enter into the origins of cinema. How she, she has some fairly radical uh, propositions about it. But anyway, an event I met Kara about a year ago, and uh, this group that we were uh, doing this thing with in Scotland, Arica, said they wanted us to do a presentation about where black cinema is, is going, whatnot, and where maybe queer cinema is, is going, is not, and how they sort of dovetail or intersect. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's funny, I found myself showing a lot of things that weren't properly speaking cinema at all. I mean, the most interesting thing to me going on right now, one of the most interesting things, some I'm obsessed with is Instagram. <coughs> Instagram is deep. Um, <laughs> it's really, really deep. Um, there's a sister who is in Finland. I don't know her last name. Her name is Frida. I know it's the first name. But if you, you might want to check it out. It's, uh, her Instagram is Nimi, N-E-M-I-E, Peba, P-E-B-A. It's pretty phenomenal. I mean, it's a series of images that she's quote unquote curated across time. Uh, hmm. It's hard to describe it, actually, even. Uh, radically personal, uh, n uh, n uh, implies certain narratives, uh, but it's nothing obvious, you know. In the beginning, I think she's been doing it for about two years now, and she generally tends to post three or four images every four or five days. I found myself trying to figure out who she was, you know, trying to identify. Uh, there was a woman in there I thought was her for a while, but it turned out that it was a friend slash girlfriend. That's what I was told as I started to get more information. I have a really good friend in Atlanta named, named Sadaji, who is the most phenomenal genius organizer of images that I know, period, flat out, Tumblr. Uh, Equinox 1600. Now, to me, this is the most interesting stuff that's going on right now in terms of people organizing images. What I did was actually, I took their images and I put them on the timeline. <laughs> and I told people in Scotland, like, well, this is not the way you really see them, because you really tend, you see them across time. But I'm making like a time lapse of them, you know, in a sense. So I gave people a compressed three or four minutes. The piece that I'm going to show, Apex, is a piece that for people who've known me for a while, know that I do these picture books. 
I don't really do them anymore because it's sort of all migrated to my computer in a sense. But I would just, I had these files and that was a project that I was working on, a big science fiction project, one of these sort of impossible to do films. Um, and um, I just started throwing these things in this file, just pictures, just, you know, like a lookbook kind of thing. But I worked on it like obsessively for about five years. Uh, I mean, over and over, there's a software called Bridge that's part of the Adobe Suite. I just over and over organize these things, over and over. I'd, I'd be talking to friends on the phone, I'd be organizing this thing. I've never did, done anything in my life that's calibrated to this level. I mean, it is, to my mind, it's not like the totality of who I am, but the truest manifestation of anything I've ever done in film. Now, and on the other hand, <laughs> there's this documentary which is really just a gathering of people who I think are smart and I felt like had something to say. Now, back to the whole thing that get, uh, Bill was saying in the beginning about the gays, like that is super central. Like one of the strategies that I use in the documentary uh, was something that sort of had evolved over years. There's this book by John uh, Gwaltney called uh, Dry Long So, an Oral Portrait of Black America. Really a phenomenal book, uh, uh, you know, oral testimonies of regular folks, whatever that is. Um, and uh, I was always struck by his introduction when he said one of the reasons that he felt like he was able to elicit these uh, really incredible testimonies from people was the fact that he was blind, that he couldn't see. He thought that freed people up. And I thought about that for years in conjunction with this other idea, which is that black Americans have a series or a set of emotional or expressive modalities that are completely tied to the proximity of the white gaze as such. Um, I mean, I think they're equivalents for women. They're equivalents for, you know, LGBT. I always get the, <laughs> the numbers wrong. But, you know, they're equivalents, like people who find themselves in structural positions of relative power lessness tend to develop these ways of being in relationship to power that are about surviving and how you manage power. With black folks, I always like to say, it's like, how do you control a situation when you're bolted to the wall? You know, if it's an S and M dynamic and you're always in the fixed position now to the bottom, sorry, and the other person is the active and you're the passive, how do you control the interaction when you're in the fixed position now to passiveness? I like to say black people do this thing I call glamoring. <laughs> we glamour. It's kind of like you're chained against the wall, a person is acting on you in violent ways, or maybe not, you know, but you're not, you're not consenting. They're acting on you. How do you control that person? Well, I think what black people tend to do is we tend to mesmerize <laughs> the person who's acting on us. So a lot of what we do, everything from, uh, you know, shucking and jiving to Michael Jackson moonwalking, it's all glamoring, you know? So, so my film, in a sense, took this basic idea, okay, if, because I extended it to this idea that if you point a camera at black people on a psychoanalytical level, that camera is also functioning as a white gaze, even if a black person is standing behind the camera. So I said, I'm just not gonna point cameras at people at all. So the whole film is structured around having conversations with people, audio only. Oftentimes the camera would be turned away so that they could see it, and then we would shoot them afterwards, or before in some instances, it all depended on the schedule. So there's no talking heads in the but whole thing. But can you say more about that? The, the idea that even if there's a black person behind the camera, the camera, it's still embodying a white gaze? Well, I mean, I think it's about surveillance and the whole idea that the way power is structured is it always drifts upward. So even if there's a black policeman knocking you in your head, at, at the end of the day, that policeman doesn't have authority. There's going to be a judge or a Supreme Court justice or a president or whatever who is presumably going to be a representative of white power, whether they are Obama and they have to be black or whatever he is or whatever. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, it's just this idea that, I mean, one of the things I think that it's really necessary, well, there are two things. It's since, I, since I evoked Obama, I'll say two things. One, I think it's really important for us to not lose sight of how he made the impossible possible. I mean, above and beyond whatever you think about his presidency, 
I didn't ever think I would see that. I, th I think that's important to remember. A lot of times when I say, okay, I want to make Apex, it's going to take $100 million, that, that's impossible to do. But I have to remind myself that it's very possible. Okay, just like black people imagined themselves out of slavery. It was very, anything is possible. Okay, but the other thing that I would say is I would hope it would disabuse us of very crude identifications with people just because he's black, we think he's necessarily going to represent the interests of black people or the best interests of black people as opposed to do, doing what he generally is doing, which is representing power and status quo. So I think it's very much related to this idea of it doesn't necessarily matter if a black person is behind the camera, because you know if your image is recorded saying X, Y, and Z, it can be used as evidence. And I think on some primal level, I think that's what's happening. Now, I don't think ultimately it's a solution to black people making cinema. We can't very much go forward with this whole idea we're never going to point cameras at people. But I thought for that particular project, because I want to privilege the idea of black people being able to speak freely as freely as possible. I mean, I told people a lot that my operative figure for myself was the usher. You know, my godmother was usher in the black church, and I was always fascinated with ushers and their white dresses and their white gloves and their hats and the formality of it. You know, oftentimes when we think of black expressivity, we think of one pole of it as it, like the sort of Coltrane, Jimi Hendrix, you know, a lot. We do a lot. We do somersaults and then we dunk the ball, you know, that kind of stuff. It's like, uh, I call it uh, speaking in tongues. It's like speaking in tongues. But there's this other pole that's the opposite of that. It, I, I term it holding your tongue. Like my, when my grandfather was very much a person who held his tongue and it elicits a certain kind of power. So. In this project, I decided I want to be like a usher. So as a person who does speak somewhat freely, I would say I had to really discipline myself to not talk. So a lot of it was an exercise in terms of setting up my audio gear, starting a conversation up, and just letting people talk without interrupting them as much as possible. Is that a, I don't know. That's a start. <laughs> I'm just thinking about a lot of the connections between conversations we had last night about whose booty is this and about the whole idea of the question of the decolonized black body. Can our body speak? And I think that's tied into what you're saying, that um, our bodies cannot speak freely as long as they are under surveillance, because sur surveillance is the key to colonization. And that if, if you've colonized well, people serve, enact rituals of surveillance themselves. Mm -hmm. You don't have to have cameras. You don't have to have spies, because people will internalize and act from that position on their own. So the question we talked about, which is so key to AJ's work, was the question of framing. How do we reframe? If that's our model, and that's what we're socialized and imprinted into, how do we break free of the frame? And you've just given us an example of a strategy that aims to take us out of the frame of bondage, of domination and submission, and give us a way to speak freely. And you know, and like you know, we talked just really briefly earlier about uh, twelve years of slavery. It just kind of came up, you know. And, Both uh, AJ and I really uh, just didn't care for twelve years of slave. Um, some of you may remember that when I was here with Melissa Harris Perry, you know, I said that I don't need to see another image of a black woman naked, beaten, raped. I mean, that 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 is the old frame. And it is still the lens through which our bodies as black females are looked, looked at through and which we look at ourselves through that lens. And when you don't want to look at yourselves through that lens, people get upset. I mean, of all the films that I've written about, my critique of 12 Years a Slave really angered people. And it, especially my, my saying that I never, I don't need to see this image. And people tried to persuade me, well, you know, people need to know what slavery was like. And I was like, but this is not what slavery was like. 
the camera posing this naked body in certain ways, the humiliating brutality that the camera shows us. Is that what slavery was like? Or is that the imagination of the estranged filmmakers' vision of what slavery was like? Yeah, I mean, I've gone on record. I think 12 Years of Slave is an abomination. <laughs> um, That's deep. Long, <laughs> I mean, for a lot of reasons, but mostly I would say I just don't recognize my family in it. I don't, as I said to Bell earlier, I feel like the problematic of how we render slavery is complex. It's not something that any individual, talented, genius person is going to solve. It's, uh, it's going to be uh, solved. I don't know if solved is even the right word. but. We're going to get at a more complex rendering of slavery from trial and error, uh, and I think that. Um, or is it a mistake to even try to um, to image it if we are still in the frame? There's no authentic image of slavery if if our obsession with is with domination and subordination. How is the frame? really going to give us any authentic uh, understanding. Remember those of you who were there last night, and I talked about um, the white males who fell in love with slave women, that they were involved in unequal power relationships with. And we only know about these through the legal documents where the family would say, the white family would try to declare that person insane. So um, first of all, I think it's fascinating that we don't know what his love looks like. Because inside the frame, there's no room to even imagine that he can love the black slave woman. There's only the image of what we get in a boring little film like 12 Years a Slave, uh, which is the image of him as rapist predator. And as I was saying last night, what is, what, what, what how does it in any way liberate us as black people to be inundated by these images that just like, they're like a loop, you know, that continually plays us back to us um, a victim and victimized image of ourselves. And yet, would we really be here today if, if the slave people were that victimized? And how is it that we can't then imagine them outside the frame of that? I mean, you know, I, I, you know, uh, when I first met um, or became aware of uh, the British filmmakers, um, good friends, uh, you know, like John and Confra and Isaac Julian and stuff. Uh, one of the first things I think I ever read with them was like a panel that they were on with this. Uh, British, white British avant-garde filmmaker named Peter Goddard. <laughs> Peter Goddard is an unrepentant Marxist materialist filmmaker who really had arrived at a film practice where he basically said the process of representing anything is inherently negative. So he had a film practice that was basically constantly trying to negotiate the problematic of showing anything. And uh, I remember Isaac and those guys, they were like, you know, they were like a little angry. They were like, okay, like as soon as we find ourselves with the means of production, you're gonna like trot in this whole new, you know, paradigm about the mechanism being in, invalid. So to a certain degree, I would kind of agree with you about this question. I would say as a person who very finally has settled on being a filmmaker after bouncing around for quite a bit, uh, I just sort of accept you know, my impulse to render certain kinds of things, and I try to encourage or assume that people will then critique those things intelligently. You know what I mean? My cousin, who's, who's very, very close to me, he's never seen 12 Years a Slave because he, he has his position the same. He's in the Nation of Islam, of course, but he has the same position as you. That doesn't serve me. I'm not even really interested. He said, I'm not even interested in a complex rendering of slavery at this point. I'm just, I want to move forward, you know? But I do feel like there's something to be um, gained uh, on some level from seeing these things. Like, say, for example, one of my critiques 
of uh, 12 Years a Slave was, again, specifically around Patsy. Lapita's beautiful, she's a great actress. Yeah, sure enough. It's kind of undeniable on a certain level. But the characterization is flawed. I think it's a profoundly flawed characterization. Um, the way, and I have a close friend who really got angry at me when I said this, when I said, well, I don't really think the way she's responding to her brutalization doesn't, it doesn't ring true to me. Like even in a film that I think is poorly made, and I don't think he's as talented a filmmaker, the butler, it has a rape scene. And what I like about it, if you can like anything about a rape scene, but what I did like about it is it's a scene where Mariah Carey plays um, the slave. I guess she's enslaved, and she has her husband there and her kids. And the master comes out, and he is very low key. It's not extravagant, there's nothing operatic about it like in 12 Years a Slave. He just comes and takes her hand to rape her, right? Now, the thing I liked about that rendering was it made clear that this is an everyday thing. This is no super dramatic thing that's happened. I'm not saying it's not dramatic, but I'm saying it's an everyday thing. And what I saw in Mariah Carey's performance in that moment that I thought was interesting was the way in that moment where she had been raped, was about to be raped, and assumed she was going to be raped again in the future, that what she was doing was thinking. She was thinking hard. She was like managing the situation. And what film was this? This is The Butler. It's a horrible oh, film. Oh, The Butler. It's a really horrible film. But in this one scene, what I really, what I, well, I liked it. I like, I said, well, you know, this is the person saying, well, this is going to go down. And what she's doing is managing the survival of her husband in that moment. She's like, I'm going to be raped. He can't stop me from being raped. I can't stop me from being raped. But I can try to spin the situation so that it doesn't spill over into him doing something that's going to have him killed, have me killed, and have our kids unprotected to whatever degree you can protect your kids under the circumstances. And I like that compared to Patsy, who I thought was infantilized. Well, yeah, uh, totally, totally passive. With the, with the passive and with the dolls. By the time they cut to the dolls, that's not in the book. They made that up. You don't say nothing about Patsy Coleman, dolls, hair. And I said this to a friend of mine, and she was like, you don't get to tell her how she responds to slavery. I said, this is not the real person. This is a character. The dude made that up. And I said, I said to me, I said, unless Patsy in that film is supposed to be literally retarded or mentally handicapped, which I'm sure there were some black people in slavery who were mentally handicapped. But by and large, I think black people had to think themselves out of that situation. So I'm not so, if you're going to say this person is mildly mentally retarded, then I, I want that to be acknowledged in some kind of way. Because, and so I said, yeah, she seems you know, kind of retarded to me, basically. And then I saw one interview, it's the only interview I've seen with Steve McQueen, it was at, uh, around the film, it was at the Toronto Film Festival, and it's outrageous. I've never seen anything quite like it. It's, uh, uh, what's his name, Elvis Mitchell, Steve McQueen, uh, Chiwetel, Lapita, Alfred Woodard on the far end, and somebody else. And I mean, you have to see it to believe it. You can Google it. But at a certain point, they, well, they asked initially Lapita, well, what did Steve McQueen tell you? She said, he only told me one thing, that Patsy was simple. She said, that's the only direction he gave me, that she was simple. Now, I don't think that exists. I don't think there's a such thing as a simple person who's enslaved. I think that's an impossibility. Unless we're talking about medically. You're, you know, there's literally something wrong with your brain. But I think that that whole notion that people have had a hard time understanding that is that this, this film was a fiction. Yeah. I had so much trouble with people who would say to me, but, but he's showing us the real thing. He's showing us, and the book this, and the book this. And I was saying, but you know, even if it really followed the book like some kind of map, it's still the imagination of something. It is not a real rendition of something. And I, I think this has been a troubling issue around black images, period. The fact that we're constantly caught up in a notion of reproduction of the real. Yes. And being judged by reproduction of the real. Now, I would throw out that, for example, the film Bell, 
was much more which film Bell. Oh right. Was right. much more interesting around a kind of discussion of slavery mm -hmm. and what slavery is and what happened. And it doesn't show us any of those kinds of scenes. Absolutely. I mean, because it problematizes something we're all involved in right now, black people, immigrants of all colors, the whole notion of who is a citizen and who exactly. has a right to life. Exactly. Um, and I think that, I mean, I, I felt like, wow, you know, it's like, it's always interesting what movies, PRs, um, you know, tell you, you should go see this, you should go see this. We were all told we should go see 12 Years a Slave. Everywhere I turned, there was somebody telling me, but nobody told me to go see Belle because it was just assumed that Belle was a nothing film. And, and again, contrast those two images of black femaleness. In Belle, we don't have um, the beaten, raped, uh, downtrodden, unable to function on her own behalf, black female. We have a black female who is making a choice to resist um, and to use whatever strategies she can use to be an active resistor. Being disloyal to Western civilization, being disloyal to whiteness, all of those things. But nobody ever mentioned that at all. And in fact, from the trailers, I just thought, oh no, is this another movie of the tragic mulatto, um, the, the you know, yearning to be a part of whiteness? And it was so much deeper than that, so much deeper than 12 Years a Slave, and yet it did not get that kind of invitation. People didn't get that invitation to come into this film, come into this film that problematizes, you know, master-slave relationship. You know, I think that um, because we're going to see the film um, clips at 6.30, we might just stop for a minute and see if there's a question and, and answer some questions So, because we're, we're kind of shaking up the normal <laughs> pattern of things where we would have seen the clips. Um, AJ's film is called Dreams Are Colder Than Death. I want you to talk about that title before. Uh, it was a joke, honestly. Uh, no, no. <laughs> uh, the original title of the film was Gla Negus Supreme. Hmm. <laughs> I'm glad we got to dreams are colder than death. <laughs> uh, and uh, at a certain point, we realized that the film was, I started referring to it as a redacted version, because they were telling us at a certain point what we could like include and that was just a time thing, because we did it very quickly. And uh, my lawyer basically just said, well, you should change the title so that when you come out with your unredacted, new, extended version of it, there won't be a conflict. And they said, and we were editing one day, and they said, AJ, we got to have that title now. It was for Germany. It was funded by ZDF. And uh, Fastbender has a film called uh, Love is Colder Than Death. So it was, it was a joke, basically. That kind of stuck, <laughs> and seems apropos too, given, you know, when we first we finished the film last summer, and uh, and people saw it who saw it initially, everybody was saying like, uh, wow, you you need to get this film out now because Trayvon Martin is happening. This is the time for this film is right like now. You need to rush and get it out, you know. And at a certain point. It became, it's like hmm. a very dark joke, but I was like, killing black folks is just not gonna go out of style anytime soon. So we didn't really have to rush for Trayvon Martin, because there's gonna be today, tomorrow, tonight, there's always gonna be another Yesterday. black person that's murdered. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So, you know, so it was like, there was no rush for that, you know, and that was a sobering sort of realization, so. A question from someone, your name, your question, don't go along. Okay, it's hard to see. I apologize, brother. Hello. Um, thank you uh, for inviting us. My name is um, Tyrone Nero, and uh, my partner and I, my business partner and I, we started this website, Black Diaries, You Don't Know My Story. And as I'm listening, one of the conversations that we're having, because we, we're our plan is to go and take all kind of dialogues from black folks. But one of the problems that we're having is, should it end in a positive 
ending. When you tell stories that people are going through and you tell what people's experiences are, sometimes it's just crappy. It just ends crappy. And I think when you tell stories and you end it with something uh, positive, you don't give the, the ability to work through that hardship, the conversation to work through the hardship. So I'm just wondering, you know, when I think about teaching and learning moments, how do you tell a hard story and end it with life sucks sometimes? I think you just tell it beautifully. Um, you know, I personally, I'm not interested in positive images or positive endings or any, I'm sorry. I'm not interested in positive images or positive endings or anything like that, personally. I'm interested in complexity. I want things to be complex, but I mean, you know, it's the oldest thing in the book, you know? I died when she left me, but you just, if you got to read the Franklin's voice, you know, it's something about the inherent tension between hmm. uh, ascending it, elevating it, rendering it powerfully, uh, owning it, I think. And so that's the thing to me. It's not so much about a positive ending because, you know, if you, first of all, if you say you got to have a positive ending, then even if it was a positive ending, it loses its power because it's overdetermined. You but know. I think that our very notions of negative and positive always keep us trapped in the prison of the binary. So what is it instead to say, if we tell stories that have to do with trauma and painful, hard moments that have happened to us, what can we do in the rendering of that story that also shows us what elements people use to survive. I've been reading Lawrence Gonzalez's books. One is called Deep Survival, and it's about, on a surface level, Deep Survival really looks at people who do high-risk sports and things, who, let's say, you get trapped at the top of the mountain in the snowstorm, blah, 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 blah. How do you survive? Or it looks at people like, I forget the year of the tr um, plane crash, where 274 people died. Uh, and one young white female teenager walked away from the crash and walked um, to safety. And so he talks about what are the skills um, that are demanded of us in extreme situations that enable us to survive. I don't really feel like there's any of us in this room who have experienced trauma that didn't have some moment within that trauma that allowed us um, to shift. That doesn't mean that that moment will feel like a positive moment, or, but that it d will reflect a different kind of image than searching for some, you know, fake way to have the Hallmark card um, indie. And I think that that's really a difficult question, again, of reframing how you see what you see. I mean, one of the things that uh, Fred Moten, a friend of mine, talks about in the film, and he references Sadia Hartman and uh, Frank Wilderson, and as he says, we have to resist the impulse to not be in the hold, like being the hold of the slave ship that there's something really important about staying in the hold of the slave, slave ship. He said, even though on a certain level, one's impulse is to evacuate that space, you know, he said, flight's a fantasy. But the thing about the hold in that is, he says, mm -hmm. is that it's precisely being in that space that produce, produces these radical notions of what flight and freedom would look like, you know? So I think it's something like that. That's one of the central conundrums of black being is that you see it all the time. It's like so many of our most important political figures, they came into their um, um, evolution in prison. So does that mean we should actively be going to prisons? Should we be pursuing going to prisons? It's just a conundrum, you know, it's a conundrum that we have to uh, understand. And but again, here's the situation of trauma. I say to people that all the time, look at Malcolm, look at all the different black males, for example, who came to 
their critical consciousness mm -hmm. in prison. But it's not prison that produced the critical consciousness. It was the fact that, uh, I was thinking about this the other day in terms of intellectual life and contemplation, they had leisure for the first time. And, and not mm -hmm. a leisure where, oh, I'm gonna take my time off and go partying. So that, be, that space being denied, then what is the active space for somebody that's in solitary or the active space? I mean, part of what becomes the active and the activated space is the mind. Mm -hmm. Because the mind is also key to the survival whole in that kind of situation that produces brokenness, uh, which is why I get so annoyed at Orange is the New Black, because it doesn't really, again, we talk about what does the camera show. It doesn't really show prison as this space that is capable of breaking and shattering people. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that that, that is um, a key to how we, do the work of decolonization and deframing that we think about. So, you know, I try to, I've been talking a lot about the James Brown movie, which I thought was such a bad movie on some levels, but then it had these moments. And one moment for me, as I've mentioned all week, is the moment when James Brown goes and thinks he's gonna get top billing, but top billing is really going to the Rolling Stones. And we see this moment of anguish, and it's the slavery moment. It's the moment where you can just see him thinking, I'm never gonna get out of this prison of whiteness and white domination. And then he gets this flash, and he says, we have to flip it. And to me, that's the moment of critical intervention where he reimagines himself. And so his reimagination, his flipping it, is he comes on so strong, so powerful, um, that no one can deny his presence, his visibility, his power as an artistic genius in that moment. And I think that that sense of it, for me, after I saw the film in terms of what we take from films that's a critical pedagogy, is I, could, I was charmed by that because I was thinking about how so much of my life has been about flipping it. You know, saying I want to write books and people saying, uh, nigga girl, who do you think you are? Thinking that I can have sexual freedom as a young black woman and, you know, having a group of black men pull me off the street and say that to me, nigga girl, who do you think you are? And that constant sense of basically they're, they're saying to me, get back into the frame. And me having to make a decision, am I going to get back into the frame? Or am I going to invent a way for me to live my life freely? Mm -hmm. Somebody else with a question? It's a little hard to see in here, so yeah, stand up if you need eyes. to. <laughs> Don't be shy about it. Yeah, really. <laughs> or is it just, OK, your name? David. Yeah, David, that would be good. Uh, so I live in Canada. Um, I'm a full-time student there. And um, you know, people always see Canada as kind of like, within and without this, it is like this kind of like bastion for like queer rights. And people always kind of assume that it's like this great place to be gay and stuff like that. And uh, you're talking about like the notion of the white gaze and how like when you're put in that situation, you like have like a different way of acting about it. Um, I personally have experienced having like this straight gaze where I'm scared to act a certain way or I'm scared to like express myself in a certain way just because you know people kind of like always have that judgment and I'm never really sure you know if I like ever come out to anyone how they're going to react to it and it's always been something that's in the back of my mind, um, something that I kind of worry about sometimes. Um, it's obviously different, you know, being like a visual minority or like a visually different person, um, how you interact with that. So I was just wondering, uh, like what you think about, um, like how people react with that white gaze or like that straight gaze in real time and how people, um, sort of like get around life every day, just kind of dealing with that. So 
I mean, well, my first thing is that, um, I mean, I'm constantly, as a person who is very unapologetically preoccupied with what I term black being, you know, like my specificity. I'm really interested in my specificity. Um, but I also am constantly, is like, why would this matter to anybody else? You know? I mean, I think it's a very re real question. Um, you know, why does blackness matter to anybody else? Why, if you're not black, why would it matter to you? Well, I would say, so, I would suggest something like, um, given the, time, the, the length and the degree of black people's oppression, um, and this obviously could be said just as uh, assuredly about women, um, there are some specific things that we can learn that everybody should be able to learn. Like, I know one of the basic things, say, with cinema is that as a black person, I grew up looking at films that didn't have black people in them. But what it really forced me to develop was a different kind of organ, an organ where I could project myself into somebody else's skin, you know, outside of the parameters of who I supposedly am as a black person, as a man. I could project myself in that and learn to identify across these so-called limits, right? This is important. I think uh, white men, just because of the structural situation, don't get to develop that muscle as much. Straight people don't get the, you know, aren't able to develop that muscle as much. But I think it's like a real cornerstone of a kind of civilization. Being civilized, being social, being a social being is the ability, it's empathy, really, at the end of the day. It's like having a highly developed sense of empathy. So, I mean, so that's what I would say is like, I don't, I don't want, I don't want to have to, I don't necessarily want to diffuse my specificity in the quest for some universalism or something. Because that, to me, is that's that's a false path to go down. I mean, you know, I, I can never understand. We just always say, like, how come, like, you know, some Greek or Roman sculpture, which is first of all accidentally white, and if it's pointing at the stars, it gets to be man's ambitions. But if I just spray paint that same thing black, all of a sudden it got narrowed down. Like, why did it get narrowed down? Why can't that black figure? be just as representative of man's, humankind's aspirations. So, so that's Now, how we have one question there, and then isn't it about 6.30? <laughs> so we'll listen to your question and. Oh, no, I'm just passing the microphone to someone. Oh, OK. So She's what? watching the clock. Oh, I see. Did you have a question? Oh, no, I was passing. Oh. <laughs> um, holding the mic. Hi, my name is Arida. I'm a student. Um, I was wondering if you could talk more about the, um, our obsession with the reproduction of real, because I feel like um, as black people and as black artists, we have a lot, like a way of expressing ourselves has been through fiction and through films and through like fictional literature, and that's how our expression of truth has like come to be, like the only way we can, Juno Dia said, like the only way I can express like my reality is through fiction because it's so unbelievable. Um, but I think this like obsession with the reproduction of real is like something that the white gaze is to like, um, puts upon us in order to like, to prove our suffering or like to prove our oppression. And so I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that. Hmm. I, I'm hesitant, again, with binaries where we're, we'll say, I mean, I use the phrase white supremacy a lot because I feel like white supremacy affects us all and is in us all. So back to earlier, we're saying that the, a lot of the surveillance we do as black people um, is self-surveillance. And so I think part of, I mean, think about how much in black life, the question of what's real comes up. You're not really black. You're not really this. And so that whole question is, is that's our fascism of, of control. You know, that uh, the oppositional frame says blackness cannot be controlled, that blackness is multidimensional um, and infinite in possibility. So that how, the question for me again becomes, how do we move away from the frame of that our representations have to be real and move into the frame of our representations have to 
honor a kind of charismatic humanity in which much is possible. I mean, in AJ's film, when you see it, um, Martin Luther King's voice and his discussion of dreams is sort of like a palimpsest that's moving throughout. But I mean, when you, when, when I always think about Martin Luther King um, in terms of that charismatic voice that is lifting you up to another plane. You know, when he says, I've been to the mountaintop, it's just, it's different from if I would just be saying to AJ, I've been to the mountaintop. I mean, I feel in that moment that, wow, this person is really speaking a profound ecstatic experience that he's had. The mean, root meaning of the word ecstasy is to stand outside oneself. So in those moments, I think, particularly with Dr. King, many of us recognize that he was transported, he was transcending. He, he, wa he was not black maleness speaking on behalf of black people. He was Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. um, anointed and anointing his own blackness. And by that self-anointing, anointing the rest of us to be free, not just black folks, but all the other people who would be touched by that level of charismatic spirit. Can we see our clips now? <laughs>
real quick? Two minutes, please. Yeah. Two minutes of the... from the new film, Dreams Are Colder Than Death. I know. I have a dream. We are going to lose this gift of black culture unless we are careful. This gift that is given to people who don't have a prayer. Frederick Douglass, people, black people 200 years ago, didn't have a prayer. Beat our skin off our bodies. Kill and rape our mamas in front of us. We didn't have a prayer. Now we're the head of international courts, president of the United States, sitting on the United States Supreme Court, presidents of universities, CEO of American Express, you name it. Some black person is it. But the price of that is to lose this precious insight that connects you to something human and bigger than white folks so I don't give a fuck what color the folk is something bigger than that we are losing that connection because we are buying this other shit I know that. I know that. Fifty years after Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, we asked a collective of African Americans. Okay. We have time for a couple of more questions, and then we're going to enjoy a moment of fellowship and celebration. Yes, your name? Yes, please. <laughs> Hi, I'm Alex. Um, so there was an article published a couple weeks ago that had an infographic that explained um, the opinions of, on race relations in America before and after the initial Ferguson uproar. Um, and it explained that people of color increasingly believed that white supremacy existed and that white people actually de uh, increasingly denied that white supremacy existed. And so that, the, the Ferguson documentation, we would consider something real. And then when you're talking about um, fictional representation in media and in cinema, um, if, if neither fiction and real documentation and everything in between within the, outside of the binary, if neither work, where does the movement go from there and what do we, how do we move from there and what, what do you think about the psychology and the ethos of American people in terms of white supremacist America? Well, the first thought that came to my head was the old the revolutionary will, the revolution will not be televised <laughs> because I don't think Ferguson has changed anything about black experience in the United States because I don't think there was anything about Ferguson that was unique to what black people experience in this culture. Um, and to, 
for anybody to act as if black people are just realizing that white supremacy is real. Uh, I think we, we do acknowledge that we black people live with certain degrees of cognitive dissonance, but I don't really, don't think I've ever encountered any black person of any class who doesn't believe that white supremacy is real. They may even think racism doesn't exist, but racism and white supremacy in many people's minds are not the same thing. Well, I would just say that, um, I don't know, this question of believability, which I think is connected to this idea of the real, whether it's people are speaking truly or something like that, I don't know. When uh, I, was, I used to teach at Bard in the summer and when the Abu Ghraib images came out, <laughs> you know, they were like maybe uh, between the students and maybe one or two faculty, it might have been like five people in the auditorium, not quite this large, but, but it was full. And uh, I think David Leventhal was showing a series of the images and it was sort of like the, the history of those images. And, uh, you know, and he said something like, the thing that struck the American public about these images is that nobody could imagine them. <laughs> You know, and I sort of gulped, uh, laughed out loud, and then everybody turned and looked at me, and I was like, oh, God. You know, and, I, and on a certain level, I felt a little, I was a little irritated because I was like, why is everybody looking at me like I'm the only person who can speak to the absurdity of this? I said, yes. I said, I'm hazard to speak for black people in some big generalized sense, but I don't think any black person is surprised by those images at all. I said, I, I, they didn't. I mean, they didn't shock me at all. I was like, yeah, if they had been digital cameras doing slavery, there would be, you know, it would be enough drives to fool the images of those things. Um, so there was nothing that shocking about it. It was more like they were so idiotic that they got caught, but it wasn't like anything about the images themselves. But I think it does go back to this whole space of like, mm. you know, who's trying to convince who? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, people get caught up in this stuff. I don't think, like, whether it's Abu Ghraib or, like I said, the next black person that's going to be killed. It doesn't mean like I'm indifferent about it, but it's just, like they say on the slave ship, many thousand gone. It's like this is a tough situation that we're in, and it's going to require a kind of lack of sentimentality. There's a certain kind of sentimentality around certain of these things, you know? And I think also, too, sometimes a lot of these structures of protest are exhausted, they are fatigued, and I'm not saying this to you know, I'm not trying to say people shouldn't go out and protest and stuff, but like, you know, the last big rally I went to was maybe 10 years ago, and you know how they have those metal gates that connect together in a certain way? I mean, this is an implement that didn't exist in the 60s. Those things were developed specifically for public unrest, and the whole way everybody was corralled, you know, it was like, I was like, wow, this is like some sort of ritual that we're doing. It's really not, it doesn't seem to be disrupting anything. I think people lose sight that when people protested in the civil rights movement, it's not so much what they did, it's less what they actually did than the fact that it was kind of a well, wide term sometimes a, a radically alienated artifact, meaning it was something that the system hadn't seen before. But once it sees it, it just sort of incorporates that. So at a certain point, you know, we have to invent new ways of resistance, I think. And we always are. I'm not, I'm not, I'm very optimistic and positive about that. But I'm not so sure a lot of the stuff that's paraded on television is that, you know, if it's real resistance or just, you know. Another question? Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Melanie. Um, and I want to ask, um, what is your take on movies such as Exodus, Gods and Kings, where black and brown bodies are not represented properly as they should be? Um, and I wanted to ask, secondly, um, is the whitewash um, dynamic of Hollywood um, that pervasive that they're really so unsettled in 2014 to play black and brown characters by black and brown people? I didn't quite understand yeah, I didn't. Those, the questions, sweetie. Well, um, in the movie Exodus, Gods and Kings, you have basically white characters. I didn't see it myself. Yeah, I didn't, okay. see, I didn't see it either, so. I didn't see it as well, but I saw a lot of articles for it online, and basically the long and short is that you had white folks playing, you know, 
the kings and all oh, the pharaohs. Right. The, yes, about yes, the yes. pharaohs and stuff. Yes. Oh, right. So I, I just want to know what your take is on that dynamic of them using white characters rather than black and brown characters to play the pharaohs and stuff. So yeah, that's really it. I mean, <laughs> I, you know, it's, I was surprised to hear <laughs> when, when you said uh, you, there were certain parts you liked the James Brown. I, I, I refuse to pay for it, you know. <laughs> But that's very easily to get around. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, honestly, I looked at the first, and I think this has some bearing on that. I looked at it, before I knew anything about the narrative or anything, I just saw the lighting and the art direction. I was like, I've seen this movie before. It's like the after school special treatment, you know, of black folks. It's kind of like James Brown is such a fucking incredible figure. I mean, even like Chad Bozeman, who is a fine actor and he's quite beautiful to look at, but he just, is, come on, he just does not have, they needed like Klingon prosthesis or something on his face to give him the weight and the density. James Brown is like one of those once in a century kind of figures, man, between the sound, his image, the way he activated space, you know? So I guess I just, you know, for me, my whole thing is, would go back to the sister's thing about that. I just saw that and I was like, okay, white people is Egyptians. I, I mean, just, I've seen it. I'm not, I'm really not even interested well, some in of having a position about it. Me talk yeah. all week about the choice of the little fair skin, fairer skinned black boy to play James Brown right there with the counterfeit. It was insane. I mean, <laughs> it was this, it's again, who is this, who's gaze? It's this four, and I mentioned white people who actually said to me, well, if it had been a dark-skinned black boy, we wouldn't have been able to identify. And then, but then again, that weed tells you who people feel this film is being made for. Yeah, and that's uh, why it's important, I think, like, like my good friend, Carrie James Marshall, who I don't know if people know his paintings, but he always has these jet black figures. And yeah, he thinks they're beautiful, but it's just a point of resistance. It's like the paper bag test. If the paper bag test say, you gotta be this complexion in order to get in, then that means, I don't know how much sector of the black community can't come to the party. But if the paper bag test is as dark as Miles Davis and anybody who is, you know, darker than that, then that means we all get to come in. So it's a little like that. That's why black figures, and I don't just mean literally black figures, but I mean black figuration is important because I think when we make radical renderings of black figures living, struggling, striving, you know, living, living, then I think it's an emancipatory uh, image for everybody. It should be, I would say. And notice that when I talked about the flip it, it's not an image. It's not in an image, it's in the idea. Because the images are all corrupt um, in the James Brown film. But that idea, which if you read about his memoirs his, and his autobiographical and biographical stuff, the idea is a part of a, a real frame of his life. Right. What propelled him. Do you have a question? Yes, I do. My name is Bay Passaway from Liberia. Um, a little bit of what AJ said. I remember I attended the Eric Garner protest and um, the slogan was, what do you call murderer, NYPD? And I remember the following day I looked at a newspaper and there was a officer handing a protester a bottle of water. And it was a complete farce. And it seemed like they co-opted this, I won't say radical, but this lively, even when Al Sharpton came on, when he started to speak, this critical consciousness just seemed to have disappeared because he started talking something that wasn't relevant. So as I watched your film, my question for AJ, and I would like Mrs. Bell Hope to tell me her opinion as well. What, where does violence play? Someone like Phenomenal, where does it play at in our era to liberate black people? You said violence? Yeah. Violence. No, because, and it goes back to um, a few days ago, I was on a train. You had some young guys, about black, about 14, about 15, 16, 17, and they was rapping and they was talking. And I looked around, I saw the faces of black people. They felt as if 
they were being surveilled. Some, some surveillance, and you saw the white people was looking at it. And I was looking at it like, you know, these were little kids. It was young, young men that they were just doing something normal. But it all comes back to, as I look in your film, I see violence. Somewhat like Miles Say Tong, revolutionary violence. So I'm wondering what into the cinema, into all of that, how does violence play a part? I mean, I mean to me, violence is a given. I mean, I, I just say conflict. You know, people having differing agendas come in conflict with each other. I, I don't like, this is sort of off a little bit, but I, I think it's a little related. Like one of the things, like I said, I, I'm really about research. I like to try things. I, I, try, I try not to go in where I think I already know where it's gonna land. I try to like to try things. And one of the things I was struck by, like I said in the beginning, we said, okay, we're not gonna point the camera at people because we think the camera does a certain violence to people. So we're not gonna point the camera at people. And uh, I was even sort of shocked. I said, wow, these, are, these things are kind of powerful. I think what people are saying struck me as being powerful. And then I would look at CNN or something, and quite literally, I know some of the people I know on CNN. I know some of the people going as pundits. They're not any less intelligent than the people that I know. So it made me start to think that there's something about the structure itself hmm. that actually um, evacuates people's power or something. And so now my question is like, okay, so we tapped on something with this, how do we intensify it? And what is it really? I mean, I have speculations about what it is, but what is it really? Why is it that when we hear Hortense or Fred or some of the people, or my father or my cousin, people speak in the film, why does it seem to have so much more weight than, I saw, I remember seeing Harry Belafonte right afterwards. So I think, you know, it's a brother, he's marched, he's made a lot of intense his life, and it just seems so empty, you know? So I'm really curious, because I do think this, I mean, to me, I guess what I'm just trying to get at is like, sure, physical violence is one thing, but we know the larger part of what we experience in the day to day is another sort of violence. It's the violence of, you know, do we, do we know we have the space to pursue our dreams and our fullest actualization of ourselves? I used, I used to use this term a lot, black potential. And what I meant by black potential was I would say, inside a black being, there's an inherent tension between whether as a black person, you will or you won't fully actualize your potential. Maybe somebody said, well, it's just human. I say, mm, not quite to the same degree when this whole idea that the inability to actualize your full potential is a kind of default state. I think that's something new and that's something very specific to our circumstance. And that's a really hmm. intense kind of violence, I think. Um, well, I think too that systemic violence that is happening all the time is very different from the spectacular violence mm -hmm. um, that, that, that the camera does love. It's like, when you think about the Black Panther Party and one of their most powerful critical interventions was the breakfast for children. That isn't how most people think of the Black Panther Party because that image uh, doesn't fit um, the frame again. The black violent uh, man that's criminalized or, or what have you, so that I think that but we have to think about the Panthers who were seeing this sort of primal violence that how can I children learn if they're hungry? I mean, that was a critical intervention of enormous weight. Um, and yet, it, isn't be, it doesn't become the remembered struggle, the remembered success. We'll have one more question and, and then break. Your name? Um, I'm Juliet. I'm a new school student. Um, I've been thinking a lot uh, in the course of this panel about images of violence, um, and I, I think that's kind of been a theme throughout, starting when you're talking about 12 Years a Slave and um, about the kind of uselessness of those images of violence. Um, but watching um, your film, AJ, um, there are a lot of images of violence and of, of kind of static moments of, of violence being done to bodies, or already done to bodies, and um, to black bodies especially. And you were talking about the images of Abu Ghraib, 
also, and that kind of no one was surprised by them, or that at least you weren't surprised by them. And I was wondering if you could shed any light or any insight on on when those images are useful and, and when they can be useful and when can we turn away? I mean, I don't think, I'm oh, sorry, I don't think images are ever inherently useful. <laughs> it's like how you use them, you know, or you try to use them. I don't think, I don't, I don't, I don't attribute, I don't, I, I guess, I don't attribute those kinds of, to things. I mean, I'm kind of, I think value is something we create. I was just in Chicago, uh, and I got to meet the Astor. Have you met the Astor Gates? <laughs> He's interesting. Uh, I like him, though. We're meandering our way towards one another. Oh, yeah. He's, <laughs> he's interesting. But the thing I liked, we, I was, we were at this thing, the Black Artist Retreat, and people made their presentations the first couple of days, and then at a certain point, there was these series of roundtables and stuff. And we got into this really, not me and him, he was listening, because he was just sort of floating around. Got into this real conversation about a lot of the artists there, they were operating under the impression that any art has any inherent value, which I just, I personally, I don't, I don't believe that. I, like, for example, I know most black folks, if they're in a boat that's crashing and sinking, and they're going to a desert island, and the Mona Lisa is here, and Frankie Beverly and May, May's record is here, they're going to grab the Frankie Beverly and May's record. <laughs> I mean, you know what I mean? And it's because I don't think the Mona Lisa has any inherent value. The only value it has is the value that's assigned to it because that value is tethered to all these other structures around the ideas of civilization, all this kind of stuff. So I was really shocked that the artists, they were holding on to this fantasy that it had. So I, I guess I feel the same way about images. It's like George Clinton said, there's no such thing as a bad note. It all depends on the note you put before it and the note you put after it, so something like that. That seems to me to be a good way to begin our celebration, to uh, <laughs> go to a, a note a uh, pleasure. It's been a very compelling experience to me uh, this week to hear so much testimony from many of you about the impact of my work on your thinking, on your life practices. And I can only say thank you, um, that I feel tremendous gratitude um, because like AJ, my, my work is my passion, it is my calling. And, but it is not um, just like it's all about me or all about celebrity or fame or something like that. As I was saying earlier today, it's about what the work does. And when people, I said that my feeling of a sort of ecstasy is not in the writing itself or the thinking itself. It's about hearing from, from people about what the work does. And then I know that, yes, I am responsive to my calling, um, to what I'm put on this earth for. And so I say thank you to Stephanie, to Jennifer and Heather and all of you, and a special thanks to AJ for coming to us without a lot of notice. And also, AJ, thank you always for your work. Um, and that AJ has given me, I know, images um, that light up my life. Thank you. <laughs>